Welcome, everybody. It's Sven Hosford, we, the media director for the Pennsylvania Medical Cannabis Society. And we're doing another podcast today to keep you up to date and informed on especially important issues for anybody who wants to be in the medical cannabis industry. Today, we have Justin Morricone and Ted Flowers. They're with the nationally esteemed uh, outfit called Siegel McCambridge. Uh, welcome, guys. How are you doing today? Hey, good morning. Good morning, Sven. How are you? I'm doing great. A little cold here, but uh, we'll survive. Um, why don't you guys uh, tell us, first of all, a little bit about your company and uh, the states you're in and how the company is uh, situated is in relation to the medical cannabis industry. Uh, Siegel McCambridge is a national law firm. As, as you indicated, we have offices in New York, Philadelphia, uh, Baltimore, Chicago, Austin, Texas, and Detroit, Michigan. And St. Louis, we just added St. Louis. Uh, it is a practice of about 180 attorneys now, um, celebrating our 30th anniversary this year. Uh, it has, it's a, a mix of litigation, some commercial work, uh, products liability included, and uh, anything else? Oh, well, we, you know, I think that the bread and butter of the firm was really built on uh, toxic exposures, which uh, you know, can be relevant to some of the issues that we're dealing with. For instance, we've encountered some pesticide issues with some cannabis companies upcoming. And so we've been able to draw on that type of experience for product recalls is another big issue we'll talk in another podcast, but we're kind of dealing with these issues uh, as they arise, but drawing on some past experience that the firm has really established itself in those types of practice areas. Well, Ted, why don't you start and tell us uh, how you personally got interested in and involved with the medical cannabis, uh, uh, the industry itself. What what drew you to it personally? Certainly, it's a, it's a mix of both personal and professional. On, on the professional side, uh, one of my one of my best friends from childhood is an anesthesiologist and pain management doctor in Pennsylvania, and over the uh, last few years, I've seen his frustration grow in trying to find alternative methods to treating his patients. And the uh, medical cannabis is an area he's focused on. And he, we speak quite often about the difficulties he's had uh, in, in trying to navigate what's become a tortured field. Uh, on the personal side, my father died from lung cancer uh, when I was 16 years old. And at the time, uh, towards the end of his life, uh, Towards the end of his treatment and his care, when he was transitioning from opiates, uh, what one of his physicians had prescribed from an esteemed hospital in, in Philadelphia was he not prescribed, but actually had given him uh, mar marijuana to help treat both his nausea and to manage his pain, which uh, I was a teenager at the time. And it, it had quite an impact on me in terms of, of, of just watching that process unfold. So that's quite, quite a compassionate doctor, doctor. Yeah. In, in the field. Well, Justin, how about yourself? Uh, what drew you to it? And what are your interests uh, in being a part of this industry? Certainly. So I've uh, been practicing for about a decade, cut my teeth doing commercial litigation, uh, really on the plaintiff side, commercial work, also some bankruptcy work. And when I came over here, kind of continued in that role, uh, really more, much larger cases, more enhanced litigation. But about two or three years ago, what I noticed about this industry was very unique in the commercial aspects of uh, its business and the problems that it was facing, like in banking, like in taxes, like in zoning, uh, like in incorporation, like in corporate structure. All of these issues are very relevant to cannabis businesses. And if you're not structured correctly, or if you don't have the right contacts with a certain government agency, or if you don't make sure that your zoning regulations meet the criteria that may be required under statute for cannabis businesses, you run into trouble. And you don't even run into trouble, you get shut down. And you cannot avail yourself of the bankruptcy uh, court protection. Those types of unique issues, those unique type of legal issues, is really what drew me to this, this industry. So I started looking at it a number of years ago. The firm is taking on cannabis clients in this space. Uh, we represent growers, manufacturers, dispensaries, and ancillary companies um, in litigation, in business disputes, uh, in getting them up and running. 
and sometimes in winding them up and exiting the market. Right now, just as many people are getting into the Colorado market as are coming out of it. Hmm. So for, on the legal side, this is really a revolving door uh, of activity and something that is really unique. You cannot go out and buy the book for $500 or $1,000 that'll tell you exactly how to practice in this area as a lawyer. You have to shake hands. You have to read vigorously. You have to keep up to date on statutes. You have to make contacts within the government. And of course, you have to keep on top of all the recent uh, legal opinions, including the one that we may talk about today, dealing with banking. Well, that is awesome. And you guys do sound like you're perfectly poised to be able to offer some awesome uh, services here to our members. And yeah, we look forward to it. Yes, thank you. Well, it's really good to have you guys on board as uh, vendor partners with the Pennsylvania Medical Cannabis Society. Uh, talk a little bit about uh, some of the, well, there's probably a lot, but some of the top key issues, legal issues that are unique to the medical cannabis business. Sure. So uh, as, as anybody who's really following this industry knows, um, medical cannabis companies, especially plant touching companies, but also ancillary companies, those that don't actually touch the plant, like lighting companies, like construction companies and the like, have very difficult pro uh, trouble getting bank accounts. And the reason for that um, is because the banks are federally insured. Uh, kind of hand in hand with that issue, uh, in these really two top issues, is banking and also the tax situation with regard to cannabis businesses. Again, anybody who knows this industry has been following it all, and probably a lot of our members are aware uh, that Section 280 of the IRS Code, in conjunction with Section 263A, only allows cannabis businesses to take the cost of the goods sold as deductions. Uh, this is crippling uh, to a new business, especially to a startup. So I view banking and IRS as probably the two top issues. There's some lower tier issues like decriminalization, um, you know, the ease of access to different patient uh, forums, uh, transferring product across state lines. Right now we're looking very closely at Oregon and Washington. Those are two states that both have recreational cannabis laws and they share a border. So it's gonna be very interesting to see what happens when patients come from one state to the next. If the price is lower in one state, cannabis businesses in the other state may actually suffer as a result. So these are kind of the, the issues that we're looking at emerging out of the, the cannabis businesses. But really the banking issue and the IRS issue, but really the banking issue I view as one of the more important issues and something that has to be resolved now we think on the congressional level. Yeah, we want to get to that. Uh, one of the things we're going to have you on the podcast very regularly is to keep us up to date with these kinds of things. And uh, we've got a new post we're putting up of your analysis of a federal court decision. Now, you, you say that this is the highest uh, level, uh, the highest opinion on the interpretation of this conundrum uh, that's been done so far. Tell us a little bit about the, the decision and then where it's going to go. Sure. Let me just give you a, a very brief background for members that aren't aware. So uh, this was a federal decision. Uh, that means that it is not a state level decision. It is a federal decision out of Colorado. Colorado, the area of Denver, has one federal court. Uh, that's, that means something because it's interpreting federal law as opposed to state law. Um, so obviously we have state laws on the books in Colorado. They really don't apply to this type of decision. This decision was based on a credit union trying to get a master account uh, through the Federal Reserve Bank. And a master account, what is that? A master account is something that a bank needs in order to make electronic transfers and deposits. Banks do this thousands, maybe even millions of times a day. So it's, it's integral to their operation. They literally cannot operate without a master account. So this, this credit union, called Fourth Quarter Credit Union, uh, petitioned the uh, Federal Reserve Bank of Kansas City for a master account. The Federal Reserve Bank denied that request should be noted that the Federal Reserve, even though it, it, the name is Federal Reserve, is actually private entity uh, made by an act of Congress. So they're not held to the same standard that a governmental entity would be held to, meaning that certain governmental entities have to act in a certain way under federal law. 
Federal Reserve could be looked at as a quasi-governmental entity, but still not held to the same standards. So when the master account request was denied, fourth quarter credit sued to have it reinstated and to uh, compel the Federal Reserve Bank to actually issue that master account. It's, it's a good decision in that it sheds some light on the federal court's interpretation of some of the guidance that's been given by the federal government over the last few years, notably the call memos, which I'm sure our members are aware of, if not a later podcast for sure, or, and the FinCEN guidelines, the Financial Crimes Enforcement Network guidelines from the Department of Justice that actually lay out what banks have to do in order to take on a cannabis-related uh, entity. And the opinion here, it was by Judge Jackson in federal court, a very smart judge, uh, an old jurist, a well-respected jurist, looked at the FinCEN guidelines and said, these things mean nothing to a federal court. It might be fine that the federal government is giving banks some guidelines on these issues, but to be perfectly frank, the federal court interprets federal law, not FinCEN guidelines. Okay, This is literally a memorandum. Uh, that is all really the cannabis uh, industry and the banking and the banks dealing with cannabis industries can rely on. It is notable right now that only about 30% of cannabis related uh, businesses even hold any type of bank account, whether it be checking, depository, or otherwise. Only 30%. Correct. So you're dealing with 70%, and this is nationwide, uh, that actually don't have any accounts at all. Uh, or they're jumping from one account to the next. So it, it, the, the classic story is of a guy named Andy Williams from a company named MedMen, uh, which was one of the earlier uh, entities in this space and has now proliferated, kind of a large entity now. Um, but they literally have one bank lined up. So when their, their, their bank uh, closes their account, when they realize they're a cannabis-related uh, business, or they just figure out that it's too difficult to comply with the FinCEN guidelines, they move their account to simply another bank. And it becomes a game of, of musical chairs uh, with bank accounts, uh, which is completely untenable for an actual operating business. Um, so <clears throat> this, this, this opinion was very important because it, it also highlighted the financial burdens, or at least hinted at the financial burdens that banks would encounter when they would try to actually comply with the FinCEN guidelines. The FinCEN guidelines dictate uh, suspicious, act suspicious activity reports, SARs, okay? And they're in three different categories. They're marijuana limited categories, marijuana priority, which, may, which means they may violate some law, or marijuana terminations, which means they vi they're violating law, they're not telling us what they're doing with their bank accounts, and now we're going to terminate their account. Those SARs are filed with the federal government. So it's a chilling effect on banks and on cannabis businesses to actually accept this money uh, and do business as usual as a normal business would. There is also a uh, system in the FinCEN guidelines that dictate currency transaction reports. And this is nothing new to any member who is familiar with the financial services industry. Any deposits or withdrawals over $10,000 must also be reported. It's not too much of a stretch to imagine that a lot of these cannabis businesses at minimum have $10,000 deposits and withdrawals on a daily basis. You so think. you can imagine all of the various uh, different guidelines and filings that a bank must do in order to just service a cannabis-related account. In fact, it usually takes one dedicated representative to handle at most two cannabis-related bank accounts. Compare wow. that to wow. a normal business that would normally take one customer service representative to handle about 100 business bank accounts. So the extra cost on that makes it cost prohibitive for banks to actually get into this space and help move this, move this along. So this opinion was very important in that it pointed out the inadequacy of the FinCEN uh, guidelines, the inadequacy of the Cole Memo, and the need for congressional action on banking in this space. So you're, you're pretty sure that we're going to be looking at some kind of action from Congress soon? Or what, what, should, what do you read the tea leaves on that one? Right. So 
there's really one, there's a few bills right now, federal bills that have been introduced to deal with the banking issue, right? And I like to actually call it, and I refer to this in my article, as banking prejudice. Uh, and I believe it is prejudicial. Because in, under the law, the word prejudice and prejudicial actually carries some weight. And that's exactly what's going on here. You're dealing with some businesses who are allowed to operate just fine, but other state-sanctioned businesses, like cannabis businesses, are simply treated differently. And it is only because that they are cannabis-related, even though they're operating under the guise of state law. So I like to call it cannabis uh, banking prejudice. I'll also refer to insurance prejudice. And let me rewind one minute, uh, if I could, Sven. Sure. In this opinion as well, in, in the fourth quarter credit opinion, Judge Jackson also hinted at the insurance prejudice that the, the cannabis industry faces. And he actually pointed backwards uh, to some precedent. Uh, now, for members who don't know, I mean, the law, of course, is based on precedent, and we build case after case. So when you have a decision that goes one way or another, courts will take that, interpret it, and use it again in later decisions dealing with similar issues. Here, we had Judge Jackson go back and reference the In Re Arenas case. Sorry, I had to look down at that one. Uh, in, the, in, in the bankruptcy arena, cannabis businesses are unable to avail themselves of bankruptcy protection, uh, which is a disaster. Yeah. Um, so he, refer, he referred back to that opinion to say, uh, hey, why are, we, why are we extending banking privileges to companies that you can't even uh, avail themselves of the bankruptcy code because they're dealing with, with the federal government terms of a, a criminal enterprise? Hand in hand with that comes insurance prejudice, which I referenced earlier. Insurance, this, this fourth quarter credit also couldn't get the, the uh, uh, financial insurance that it needed to operate as well. So the judge took that to mean, even if he did come out and say, Federal Reserve, you have to issue a master account, they still would be able to get insurance on it. So that really handcuffed fourth quarter credit pretty badly in this case. Okay. Uh, you know, but it, that's, that's really the, what we're looking at. And after this opinion, uh, we're going to start following to see how many banks either close accounts or pull out of the space. Yeah. Well, uh, one, one last quick question here uh, before we look ahead to what we're going to do together. What do you, uh, how do you read uh, or do you read any of the tea leaves in Harrisburg? Do you think we're going to have a bill here or let's, let me put it another way. When we get a bill and it's reasonably close to Senate Bill 3, are we going to have a good sustainable industry that can be built on that current legislation? Well, right now, I mean, Justin has pointed out previously that the good thing about Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania's legislation is that it'll create a level of certainty which you don't find in many other uh, jurisdictions that have passed such legislation. The belief now is that we have a governor in place who was just recently uh, elected who is 100% supportive of the legislation and the legalization of medical cannabis. So he's behind it. The, you know, it's a political pitfalls in Pennsylvania because of budget concerns and budget issues that, that have pushed this to the back burner. But the belief is that maybe in the first quarter we'll get some kind of traction on the legislation itself. There was a lot of chatter out there to try to get this moved forward from perspectives nationally of what has happened nationally, uh, what's happening in New York, what's happening in New Jersey, what's going to happen uh, up in the New England states uh, as the year goes on, that there is some push behind the legislation in Pennsylvania. And there is a ground swell of movement towards that. So there, there's hope that a lot of the holdouts from, from prior uh, Congress or Congresses are, are starting to turn towards what we see as a more uh, just system. And Sven, if I could just piggyback on what Ted said just briefly, you know, the, the system in Pennsylvania, what we think, what we believe is going to be the, the framework for ma cannabis manufacturing and dispensing, uh, we think is gonna be very robust uh, compared to neighboring states like New Jersey, New York, and Delaware. Uh, we like to look at Maryland right now as kind of the bellwether uh, the application period in Maryland closed on November 5th. There were uh, over a thousand applications in Maryland just for dispensaries and manufacturing facilities. Mm -hmm. um, that being said, in Pennsylvania, we're looking at to have approximately, and, and all this is still up for speculation, but really all the tea leaves uh, point to this direction in that there are going to be about 25 manufacturing 
licenses. Um, and man by manufacturing, I'm talking about cultivation and processing together. Right. Um, and there's going to be about 25 of those, five of which may be vertically integrated. So that means they will not only manufacture, but also dispense. The remaining 20 licenses will probably be manufacturing licenses, and there will be up to 50 dispensary licenses, each of which license holder will be, have, be able to have three locations. So you're looking at a fairly robust market in about approximately 150 dispensaries alone in the state of Pennsylvania. While we still think that's inadequate for the overall population, it's certainly more robust than New York with 20 dispensaries or New Jersey with five or six dispensaries right now and Delaware with one. So we view that as, as, as very exciting. We're also looking at the statute in, to, to see if they're going to keep in the language for reciprocity between states. And if Pennsylvania allows reciprocity like that, you're looking at a much larger market in Pennsylvania for people coming in from New York, New Jersey, and Delaware as well as Ohio if they don't have a statute already. Yeah, and that, that's yeah, really that's fascinating. And you guys have, as you I said have before, have offices have in offices all those states. So you really have good right. resources to draw on. Certainly. And the legislation in Pennsylvania has taken more time than, than anybody wanted, but what they've come up with with a finished product, if it goes through it as currently postured, is an excellent at least start for the state. Well, you know, Go ahead. And uh, you said the 50, uh, uh, up to 150 locations of dispensaries is uh, inadequate for Pennsylvania. What do you think is, uh, you know, five, 10 years down the road when we have a more vibrant uh, and established industry, what do you think a good solid number should be? Okay. And I view this as a really, really easy question to answer. This is a market that should be like any other market. Okay. So I view this as uh, a, a capitalist type of market. I think the market should demand how many dispensaries and how many manufacturing facilities a certain population or certain market can handle. The ones who aren't successful will go out of business. The ones who are will stay in business. This is the way we do business in the United States. Um, there's really, I don't see any reason to cap a number of licenses or cap a number of dispensaries. It makes no sense to me whatsoever and it kind of goes against basically everything that the American capitalist system stands for. And even if they do, I mean, if, if the default is to have some kind of cap on the number of licenses, it should mirror more closely what's going on with liquor, with the liquor licenses in Pennsylvania, which is, a, which is done by the uh, population. And it's a measure of the population, so which would still it, it, um, significantly increase the amount of licenses up being offered. And really, since Ted follows that, that liquor law fairly closely, and I don't know if you know, our members know this, but they probably do, Pennsylvania is really enjoying um, a privatization now of liquor, beer, a different way to buy and sell alcohol in supermarkets. You can now buy 12 packs and six packs from uh, beer distributors where you used to be able to buy a case. And you can now buy beer and wine in, in supermarkets. This is the type of movement that's happening in that liquor field right now in Pennsylvania. We think it will ultimately translate to the cannabis market as well. So you're going to be looking at a lot of those you know, more private enterprises being able to be really successful and profitable in Pennsylvania because we do now are getting away from the, uh, you know, I view the blue sky laws really uh, of the mid 20th century uh, and the early 20th century that were introduced and still exist in states like South Carolina and down south where you still can't buy liquor on Sundays and such like that. Yeah. So that's changing in Pennsylvania. Yeah. Um, and we do have a lot of support for that. Sven, if I could just rewind for one moment. Sure. I, I wanted to just point out when we talked about what's going on with banking, uh, it, it would be it would be terrible for me not to mention the, the Currors Act. Okay. And uh, what that is is the Compassionate Access Research Expansion and Respect States Act of 2015. What this does, it goes, it's, it's a very short bill. I would encourage our members to go ahead and just Google it and pull it up. It's only a few pages long, but it does address straight on the banking issue and it precludes banking regulators. And I'm not gonna go into what a banking regulator is. It includes things like the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation and things like that, um, but it precludes these banking regulators from what I term, and, 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 the, and the statute's pretty good on talking about this, the career uh, statute, the prejudice that these regulars, these regulators can exercise on these businesses. It's precluding them from doing that. And it's precluding them from even doing it in, a, in, in, in an end around manner, 
meaning coming up with uh, other reasons why that they should deny these bank accounts to cannabis businesses, even though it's related to cannabis. It precludes that. So it's a very aggressive law. It's a very progressive law. It's currently pending um, in the federal government. <clears throat> I, I view that bill as definitely a watershed moment, but almost like a first shot across the bow of the Congress as to what uh, these states that have medical cannabis laws and recreational cannabis laws need in order to survive. And, and of course, as we know, uh, not having, having an all-cash business increases crime, puts people in danger, and really proliferates a black market, which is exactly what we're trying to get out, uh, get out of our uh, United States right now. You're always going to have moonshiners, okay? I, mean, I think there's a, a special on the History Channel now called Moonshiners, okay? I mean, that alcohol legalization for almost 100 years now. Okay, you're always going to have an element of that. But really, for, in order for these cannabis businesses and these recreational markets to survive, that market needs to either sh shutter or become significantly reduced. And right now, even in Colorado, it is proliferating. So there's a huge black market in, inside Colorado, even though we have a fully a recreational market there. And that really speaks to the banking prejudice and the insurance prejudice that these companies are suffering from. No, that's fascinating. Uh, so just, just that banking prejudice problem is keeping the black market thriving in Colorado, where it's perfectly legal to buy and sell recreationally. Absolutely. Uh, and that repeats itself in other states that will continue uh, to regulate cannabis, California, Washington, Oregon, Alaska, all of these Nevadas coming up. Uh, we're looking at some New England states coming up with possible rec or legalization. Vermont is pushing pretty hard right now. We just got a statement from the governor of Vermont that he'd like to introduce legalization uh, legislation this year. Uh, so there is going to be some East Coast activity on this. And I think once you get both coasts involved, uh, then you're gonna then you're gonna find uh, some movement on this a little, a little quicker, especially yeah. in and around Washington DC. Yeah. yeah. Just piggybacking on Justin's uh, um, comment about the legitimacy of the banks and and trying to get more um, a streamlined market here. Recently, there was a large develop actually big development in commerce this week where a company known as TerraTech, I think on January 13th. Uh, announced its purchase of a California-based dispensary, which, you know, without going through all the details of it, what it is is it's the first um, uh, fully integrated cannabis business which will be traded on the Dow Jones uh, as a stock that can be bought and sold. Uh, Terratech itself is in, is a uh, two-fold business that deals with hydroponic produce and cannabis products. So this was a large development this week. They're actually, it's the first fully integrated cannabis business, cannabis derived business, which will be out there uh, being traded on the Dow Jones and uh, the New York Stock Exchange. So it, it's a significant move towards legitimizing what, what should be a, a, a clearly well accepted and recognized um, business. Oh, and you can cool. imagine a publicly traded company like that really having to utilize banking services pretty much can't exist um, without banking services. Yeah, I can't even, uh, like, how do they even get their banking done? I mean, they, they have to be talking about some real money. Absolutely. And, and, you know, what's going on right now is kind of a wink and a nod and a handshake. So a, a lot of banks uh, may be doing businesses with cannabis-related companies, but they're just not... They're, they're definitely keeping quiet. They're not talking about it. So you are having businesses, as, as I referenced earlier, you do have about 30% of the cannabis businesses nationwide utilizing banking services. Yeah. We just don't know exactly who those banks are. Uh, we have a pretty decent idea, um, and, 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 the, and you can, and you can you know, shake the globe and, and see what the magic eight ball might say. Um, but you know, this is what we're dealing with. It's kind of a very, I don't even like to call it a gray area. It's a dark gray area. Yeah. Um, and one other point I really wanted to make was just, just to wrap up the banking issue a little bit for today's discussion anyway. Yeah. Now I found, the, the, in, in addition to the CARS Act, the, the Senate actually tried to introduce legislation identical to the CARS Act in some amendments uh, to the financial services spending bill last year. Uh, and while they were successful in, in, in getting those uh, amendments voted on in the Appropriations Committee, they never moved beyond that. But I wanted to point out this. In the Appropriations Committee, the vote on banking services for cannabis 
came to 16 to 14. It was pretty close. It carried the day, mm -hmm. but you're still finding on the federal level, not resistance, but it's definitely not a runaway, everyone's behind it type of issue. There's still a lot of education that has to be done, both from the federal level and really through our members reaching out to the local congressman or local senator and telling them, this is what we support and this is what we want. That's the only way it changes, believe it or not. These guys really do listen to their constituents, and that's something we really need to push forward in 2016. Yeah. Well, you guys, uh, you give us timely and uh, really extremely uh, interesting and I'm sure important information for many of our members. So we're really happy to have you on board and we'll be bringing you back regularly on the podcast where I ask the questions, but we're also going to be developing some micro webinars. And this is where uh, you guys can come face to face, probably right here on the Google Hangout. Um, with the members and they can ask you questions and we can address these topics the banking and, and the IRS as you say uh, very specifically uh, and the members can ask you directly uh, what's what's happening so we're looking forward to that and I really appreciate you being with us today thanks a lot yeah Thank we're looking forward to it as well and uh, so Justin Maraconi and Ted Flowers with Siegel McCambridge uh, it's great to have you on board thanks again hey, thanks thank a lot you. Sven.